In the previous lecture, I showed how Supernova 1987A, the brightest supernova in 400 years, confirmed our basic ideas of how massive stars explode by having an iron core that collapses, produces a bunch of neutrinos, and then rebounds and expels the outer layers. But that supernova also showed that we need to refine our models. In some cases, it's not just red supergiants that explode. Blue supergiants can explode as well. Now, you might ask, well, all right, that's great. 87A showed the basic model, but it didn't give quite the right kind of star. Do we have evidence that some other type II supernovae do have the expected red supergiant progenitors? Indeed, we do. And in fact, recently in 2005, there was a great example of a supernova in M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, which isn't very far away, just a few tens of millions of light years away, a stone's throw for astronomers. And this was a bright supernova that could be observed very well with the Hubble Space Telescope. And in particular, we had pictures of that part of the galaxy which showed the star that later exploded. So here's a photograph taken on January 21st, 2005, before the explosion. And there it is on July 11th, 2005, after the explosion. And this region of the galaxy is right there in this little green square. And taking a close-up look at that region of the galaxy, we can see the star before it exploded and after it exploded. And we can pinpoint exactly which star it is. And it turns out that this was a red supergiant having about 12 solar masses. So indeed, in many cases, in most cases, we think that it's the red supergiants that explode. This thing had a more normal light curve, normal spectra, and in other ways, this one and other similar events that we and other groups have observed have confirmed pretty much that the cores of red supergiants implode, leading to an explosion as I just discussed. Now, in all of these cases, the imploding core should form a neutron star, a very dense ball of neutrons held up essentially by neutron degeneracy pressure. Now, this is similar to the electron degeneracy pressure that I had discussed for white dwarfs. Basically, it's like you have an apartment building where only two neutrons of opposite spin can occupy each level. And so the ones that are up here cannot jump down to lower energy levels because all of those energy levels are already occupied to the maximum possible extent. And so since all these neutrons up here are moving around very, very quickly, they're very energetic, they exert an extra quantum mechanical pressure that cannot be described in the usual terms of just objects, particles, you know, moving around due to their thermal motions, due to the heat associated with them, due to their kinetic energy. This is a, a purely quantum effect having to do with neutrons, like electrons, essentially not liking each other and not wanting to be in exactly the same quantum state. So when you have a structure like this held up by neutron degeneracy pressure, it can be rather small. A neutron star having roughly one and a half times the mass of the sun can be only about 12 miles in diameter. So that's really small, about 20 kilometers in diameter. All the neutrons in this one and a half solar mass worth of material are crammed into this tiny, tiny, tiny volume. And in fact, the density is so high that a billion, that is a thousand million tons, would be in one teaspoonful of this material. I mean, that, you know, a billion tons of stuff in a teaspoonful. That's a far cry from white dwarfs, which had only a few tons of material per teaspoonful. But, you know, you try holding a, a few tons of even white dwarf material, and I think you'll, you'll have a hard time. So, you know, a neutron star puts white dwarfs to shame. Now, a neutron star has some similar properties to those of a white dwarf. Being made of degenerate material, it is smaller the more massive it is. So again, unlike bricks, where you have more of them and they, they take up more volume, in the case of a neutron star, if you have, if you have more mass, the, the gravitational effect is stronger and these neutrons get squeezed into an even smaller volume before their energies get high enough to keep the star you know, from, from collapsing in on itself. So the, the more massive ones have the smaller size. 
Now, neutron stars were predicted by Fritz Zwicky and Walter Bade in 1933, just a year after Chadwick's discovery of the neutron. And I described in the previous lecture that Zwicky in particular was a rather interesting character. His colleague Walter Bade was much more friendly and sort of got along with, with people better and didn't call his colleagues spherical bastards and stuff. But anyway, Zwicky and Bada were, were just amazing in that they predicted the existence of these neutron stars and even said that they are probably produced during cataclysmic explosions of massive stars. And they did this in 1933 and they published a more complete paper in 1934. Now, you have to go forward about four decades, even more, before neutron stars were actually discovered. And they were discovered by Jocelyn Bell in the form of pulsars. Pulsars were objects in the sky that couldn't be seen clearly, but, but from the regions in which they exist, some, that is from certain regions of the sky, there appeared to be pulses of radio radiation coming that, that were very regular. The first one that was found by Jocelyn Bell had a period of 1.337011 seconds. I mean, every single time, 1.337011 seconds. Bump, bump, bump. So here it is. Here's a plot of the radio brightness versus time from this region of the, of the sky where there's some sort of an object producing, you know, a blip of radio radiation, then 1.3 seconds later, another blip, then another blip, and so on. And, and the spacing was very regular, although the intensity or brightness of the blips varied considerably with time. So this was just really weird. I mean, what is producing very regular blips of radio radiation from, from at least this one part of the sky where there was this first object discovered? The astronomers didn't know what was going on. Jocelyn Bell said, here's the data. And Anthony Hewish, her advisor who built the radio telescope, didn't even really believe that it was true. He reportedly said, rubbish, my dear, when presented with the data, because it just seemed impossible. No stars were known with such regular periods of pulsation or oscillation or orbital periods or whatever. So he didn't even believe it. But then the data looked like they were pretty good. So the astronomers for a short time considered the possibility that these were, so to speak, little green men communications from extraterrestrials, maybe not from Mars. I mean, these, this part of the sky was nowhere near Mars, but some sort of extraterrestrial intelligence that was communicating either intentionally or unintentionally. But the trouble is shortly thereafter, they found several more cases of these pulsars in other parts of the sky with very regular pulses, but having different periods than the first one. So maybe 0.7 seconds or 2.1 seconds or whatever. And it seemed unlikely that there was this vast interstellar network of, of civilizations all communicating in the same way using these very regularly spaced blips, you know. Moreover, there was no evidence of any Doppler shift having to do with the planet from which the signal is originating orbiting around a star. In other words, there were no Doppler shifts uh, recorded of any sort. And so it looked like these things were not coming from something that's orbiting anything else. So the little green men idea disappeared after a while. And quickly, theoretical physicists figured out that probably these things are rapidly rotating, highly magnetized neutron stars. And one of the clues was that they're found mostly in the plane of our galaxy. Now, here's a map of the Earth in a very special way. This is the whole Earth um, in this oval here. The poles are at the top and the bottom. And Yet it's the whole Earth then projected on a, on a finite flat sheet of paper. So there are some distortions, but, but uh, the poles are at the top. The equator runs across the center here. If you make a map of our own galaxy in the same way, you can see that it looks like this thin disk. It's a flat spiraled galaxy, and we're looking through the disk here. This is essentially the Milky Way, and there's a bulge in the center. I'll talk about this a lot more later when I discuss galaxies in detail. But it was found that basically the pulsars come from the plane of the Milky Way. See, most of them are concentrated toward the plane, and there's some up near the poles, but not many, and some at intermediate galactic latitudes. So it looks like they come from the plane. And 
they are probably associated with massive stars because massive stars tend to be concentrated toward the plane and lower mass stars have a, a much broader distribution up above the plane in what's called the halo as well. So people thought, well, probably they're massive stars because of the concentration toward the plane. And maybe there's some sort of a weird magnetic effect associated with neutron stars. And the, the logic that they went through was essentially a, a very interesting process of elimination. They said, okay, well, there are three basic classes of models that might produce blips. There could be stars that are oscillating in size or vibrating, get, getting bigger and smaller, and that might somehow lead to observed pulsations in radio brightness. Well, if you ask yourself, how does that work for a normal star like our sun? Well, it, it works. Our sun is actually undergoing small vibrations like this, but the time scale is of order minutes. In some cases, it's hours for other stars. In some cases, for some very dense stars, it might be just a, you know, a minute or so. But the point is, all those time scales are too slow compared with the one second time scale or the tenth of a second time scale observed for pulsars. So normal stars clearly can't be what's oscillating. What about white dwarfs? They're smaller and denser, and it turns out their natural oscillation period is about 10 seconds. That's getting close, but it still doesn't explain the one second or tenth of a second periods for pulsars, okay? So white dwarfs are sort of out of the picture. Then there was the possibility of a neutron star. A neutron star is very dense and it vibrates and like this, it's like, you know. Well, the trouble is they vibrate too fast. Their natural period is one one thousandth of a second. So that's too fast to be the typical tenth of a second to a second period of, of pulsars. So oscillating stars just don't work. So then you could say, all right, well, maybe another class of models would be stars that are orbiting one another. How about normal stars? They can't orbit each other in one second or 10 seconds or a tenth of a second because they're too big. You can't fit them within the orbit. What about white dwarfs? Well, they can do it almost, but they, they too are, are too slow. A few lectures ago, I showed you two white dwarfs that are orbiting each other in five minutes. That's really fast. I mean, that's, that's, that's amazing. But it's not one second or a tenth of a second. What about neutron stars? Well, they can orbit each other very quickly. They can be very close together because they're so small. But in that case, gravitational waves are emitted, as I'll discuss more in a future lecture. And that carries away energy, which eventually causes these neutron stars to spiral in toward each other and merge. And the spiraling in would cause the period of, of the pulsation, which is related to the orbital period, to decrease with time in a measurable way. And pulsar periods, if anything, were slowly increasing with time. A given pulsar has a period that very, almost imperceptibly increases with time, doesn't decrease. So, so orbiting neutron stars don't really work either. Finally, suppose a star is rotating. Maybe the rotation time about its axis somehow produces, you know, or some, is the right time scale and there's some way of producing a, a pulse of light. Well, a normal star rotating at once a second would just fly apart, right? You, you try rotating really fast and you'll fly apart too, okay? So it's not dense enough. A white dwarf also rotating at once per second or 10 times per second would fly apart. The centrifugal forces trying to essentially disrupt the thing would be greater than the gravitational forces trying to hold it in. But a neutron star is so dense and small and the gravity is so strong that a neutron star can easily rotate up to about a thousand times per second, but easily once per second or ten times per second, and hence could be consistent with the time scales observed for pulsars. So that's the reasoning that physicists used and astronomers used to deduce that probably these things are some sort of a rotating neutron star. Now, this was obviously a, a great discovery. You know, pulsars showed that neutron stars exist and they, they even rotate really rapidly. And a lot of physics was done with these things subsequently. So in fact, Anthony Hewish was given the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1974, the Nobel Prize in Physics. But Jocelyn Bell was not. I mean, why not? You know, she was the one who actually identified the pulsars and, and Hewish even didn't believe the data initially. 
Hewish deserved part of the prize. He made the radio telescope and designed a lot of good techniques with which these observations could be made. But surely the person who found the pulses should have been rewarded as well. And it's one of the greatest injustices ever in, in science that Jocelyn Bell was robbed of the Nobel Prize in physics. That's the way it goes. I really feel sorry for her. She took it in good stride. She, she doesn't feel too bad about it. All right, well, the clock mechanism is this rotation, people said. But what makes a pulsar shine? We don't really know exactly, but the basic idea is that you have a magnetic field that's in the neutron star and surrounding it. And the axis of that magnetic field is not the same as the rotation axis of the neutron star. So you get this conical sort of pattern as the thing rotates, where the magnetic axis first points in one direction, then in another direction, and so on. Now, in some cases, you might make electric fields in this rotating magnetic field that are strong enough to accelerate electrons to speeds close to that of light along the magnetic axis. And accelerating charged particles produce radiation along their direction of acceleration. So you might have two oppositely directed beams of electrons producing oppositely directed beams of light. And those beams of light point in different directions as the star spins around its axis of rotation. And let me show you then a, a demo. It would be kind of like a lighthouse. The lighthouse is on all the time, but you only see it when it's pointing your way. So here, here I have a laser pointer. It's on all the time as I'm pressing the button. But you don't see that light until the rotation brings it exactly across your line of sight. And as it rotates around again, it can do it again. Bam, like that. You see the blast of light every time it intersects your line of sight. So that's the idea with this rotating beam. It's on all the time, but you see it when it happens to pass across your line of sight. Now, what actually produces the beam in detail? We don't really know. That's complicated physics. Why is the magnetic field so strong? We think it's a, a trillion times as strong as the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field is about one gauss. That's a unit of magnetism. And, uh, and, and a neutron star has a trillion gauss. I mean, we're not sure what, what produces such a strong magnetic field. But one idea is that the star already had a magnetic field going through it. I mean, our sun does, for example. And as it collapses, that magnetic field gets scrunched into a smaller volume and the magnetic field strength increases. You can get a big increase in magnetic field strength that way. It's not quite clear yet whether you can get an increase up to a trillion gauss, but at least we're on the right track. And why is it rotating so quickly? Well, that's a little bit more easily understood. All stars rotate to some extent, and as they collapse, the spin has to increase in order to conserve the angular momentum, the product of spin rate and mass and size. Remember the example of the ice dancer bringing her arms in and she spins faster. Well, in a similar way, a star that collapses will spin faster. And indeed, you can reach spin rates of 1 or 10 per second uh, in this, in this mechanism, using this mechanism. Now, in the middle of the Crab Nebula, the most famous supernova remnant, there's a pulsar that in fact spins and pulses, is seen to pulse, about 30 times per second. It's that star right there. And here are two photographs of it, when it was pointing at us and when it wasn't. So when it's pointing at us, you can see it, and when it's not, you can't see it. And this is actually a photograph taken at optical wavelengths. So very young pulsars shine not only at radio wavelengths, but at optical wavelengths and, and uh, x-rays and, and things like that as well. It's only as they get older that the higher energy forms of radiation die out, and what remains are the low energy forms of radiation, the radio waves. So in this Crab pulsar case, detailed Hubble and Chandra views at optical and x-ray wavelengths, respectively, show a wind coming out from that region where the rotating neutron star not only is producing these jets of material in these directions here, but also a wind of material going out along the equatorial plane. And this wind and the jets are energizing the Crab Nebula, causing it to glow so brightly as in this photograph right here. 
So the pulsar is essentially re-energizing the nebula and causing it to glow even more brightly than a supernova remnant would have had it not had a pulsar activating it all the time. And as this energy energizes the nebula, well, the, the pulsar had better slow down because the energy has to come from somewhere and it comes from the rotational energy of the neutron star. So as these beams of light and the equatorial winds come out, you rob the star, the neutron star, of rotational energy and it should slow down. And indeed, astronomers observing the crab pulsar have noticed a marked slowdown in its pulsation period over the course of the years that we've been observing it. So this is all, all kind of hanging together. It works out pretty well. Now, eventually, as the rotation period becomes too slow, the pulsar could die because as the rotation gets too slow, the electric fields that are generated by this rotating magnetic field become insufficiently strong to accelerate charged particles so you don't get the beams of light. Moreover, with time, the magnetic fields die down as well. They sort of dissipate away. So we expect pulsars to remain on for only about a million or a few million years before both their magnetic fields and their rotation rate diminish to sufficiently low values that beams of light simply aren't produced anymore. So every pulsar is a neutron star, but not every neutron star will be visible as a pulsar. Some will have died, all right? After a few million years, they no longer shine as pulsars. Or some might have axes of rotation that don't allow the beams of light to cross your line of sight. In that case, you won't see it either. So every pulsar is a neutron star, but not every neutron star is visible as a pulsar. And here is a neutron star in the middle of the remnant Cassiopeia A, and it's, it's a glowing neutron star. It's a hot young neutron star, only a few hundred years old, but it isn't a pulsar, either because it's not pointing our way or because it isn't on for some reason. Maybe it's not rotating fast enough or maybe the mag magnetic field isn't strong enough. Now, typically pulsars spin at about one time per second or 10 times per second or maybe once every 10 seconds, something like that. But there are some pulsars that can spin hundreds of times per second. And in fact, we call these things millisecond pulsars. They have spin periods of just a few milliseconds. And if you were to take the frequencies at which they spin, like 642 times per second, and convert it to an audible signal, this would correspond to a note in about the middle of the piano keyboard. So a bunch of these millisecond pulsars have been found spinning 200 times per second or 642 times per second or 315 times per second. And if you make audible notes out of those things, mm, 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 you could actually create a pulsar symphony. And some astronomers have written musical pieces with the notes of known millisecond pulsars. These guys, by the way, spin so fast because we think that they've been spun up through accretion of material from a companion star. The whole thing is, is rotating. It's a binary system. And the material coming into the accretion disk is also rotating, and when it lands on the star, it can actually spin it up. So we think these are actually very old neutron stars that have been spun up a considerable amount. Now, a very interesting discovery was made in 1991, where one pulsar was found to actually have planets orbiting it. Now, that's amazing. These were actually the first extrasolar planets found, 1991, preceding even the discovery of 51 Pegasi in 1995. They were discovered by Alex Wolshan and his group at Penn State University. And they were discovered around one of these so-called millisecond pulsars that actually has a spin period of just 162 times per second. And what was noticed was that sometimes the pulses arrive a little bit too early compared to the expectation, and sometimes they arrive a little bit too late. That's shown in this graphic here, where the red dots are the expected arrival times of this very fast pulsar. 162 times per second, you get a blip. But what was observed was sometimes the blips are earlier than expected, and at other times they're later than expected. And this would be the case if the pulsar and a planet orbiting it both orbit their common center of mass, so that when the pulsar is on the far side of the center of mass, we see the 
pulse a bit too late, and it and when it's on the near side, it it appears the pulse appears a little bit earlier than expected. So this sort of analysis of the arrival times of the pulsars show that this thing is probably being orbited by three planets, about oh two tenths of an astronomical unit up to half of an astronomical unit from the star. And the orbital periods are from 25 days to about 100 days. And indeed, their masses are comparable to the masses of the terrestrial planets in our own solar system. So that's really groovy. I mean, that these things not only were the first extrasolar planets found, but they are comparable to terrestrial planets in our own solar system. And there might even be a fourth planet in this system, but that's more controversial. Now, these are certainly not normal planets. They couldn't have existed before the supernova that gave rise to the pulsar occurred because they would have been blown away in that process. They would have been just disintegrated or, or launched away from the system when the star blew up. So they probably formed from a disk of debris around the neutron star that remained after the explosion. And indeed, recently, another neutron star has been detected, which presumably came from an explosion like this. And around that neutron star, there is visible a disk of debris which could coalesce to form planets. So here's a neutron star around which there is a debris disk that could form planets. That's amazing. So, you know, if you have planets around a neutron star, you'd better also find cases of the stuff from which those planets formed. And indeed, we think we have cases like this um, in, in at least this one situation. Now, there's a very interesting observation that has been made in the last decade or so that some neutron stars have really incredible magnetic fields up to a thousand times stronger than even the trillion Gauss magnetic field of a normal neutron star. These are called magnetars. They are the strongest magnets in the universe. If you had one of these things pass within about half the moon's distance from us, it would instantly erase all the data on all of your credit cards and magnetic tapes and all that. So take care of your credit cards if one of these things comes nearby. They have they have incredible, incredible magnetic fields, 10 to the 15 power Gauss. And in fact, these magnetars, an artist's impression of which is shown right here, sometimes emit tremendous amounts of energy because apparently the structure of the crust of the neutron star changes and it's like a star quake. And also the magnetic field changes in that region and releases the tremendous amount of energy, or at least part of the energy associated with that magnetic field. Now, a, an amazing case of one of these outbursts was observed on December 27th, 2004. This was the brightest flare ever seen from outside our solar system. It occurred in the constellation Sagittarius. There was this great flare, and then it sort of pulsed a few times, and nothing like it had ever been seen before. It was really, really bright. So bright, in fact, that it affected Earth's atmosphere. So here is this rotating neutron star. Let's put it far away from us at a safe distance. It undergoes a flare like this, sending out a pulse of gamma rays and debris. The orange stuff is the debris. The pulse of gamma rays travels at the speed of light and it reached Earth. It activated the sensors on a bunch of satellites. And in fact, it even affected our atmosphere. It actually ionized our atmosphere. The satellites transmitted the information to radio telescopes down on the ground, which immediately moved over and started observing that location of the sky. And they found a bunch of debris moving out at speeds that are a significant fraction of the speed of light. So this was just an incredible outburst of energy that was not itself a supernova but rather apparently the restructuring of the surface layers of a neutron star. And here's an animation that shows what we think happened. There was this burst of gamma rays as the surface of the new neutron star restructured itself. And it continued to rotate then, and we saw these flashes of light as the north and south poles alternately came into view and then out of view. So there was a big flash, and then there were lots of these little pulsations. And overall, then, we think that this was basically a neutron star 
with an interior of sort of liquid neutrons and other particles. And there's a solid crust, which essentially buckled or cracked and, and changed its configuration. And in that process, changed the configuration of the magnetic field itself, releasing in one tremendous burst, a huge amount of energy, a giant amount of energy. And we know that these things survive this basic burst because some of these objects have been seen to repeat after a few years. So maybe 10 years from now, this particular one will produce an even bigger burst. But for now, this is the biggest burst this guy has produced or any other of these magnetars has produced. And wow, are they exciting. But don't get anywhere near one, especially if you have a pacemaker, because it'll definitely mess it up.